Today I'm going to talk about quarks. You've probably heard about quarks as elementary particles, but I'd like to introduce you to a simpler quark. Here it is. It is a Central European cheese. It's a curd cheese, very popular in Germany. So this is my version of quarks. I'm going to talk about what the evidence is for quarks, because you've never seen one apart from this. That's the first time you've seen it. In fact, the theory of quarks was invented by two different people at the same time. One of the big things that we try and do in uh, physics is to work out the building blocks of nature. What are the, the Lego bricks from which everything else emerges, you know, whether it be the chairs and the room, the, the doors, you and I. Before the 60s, we just thought about elementary particles as being protons and neutrons with electrons whizzing around them. And the protons and the neutrons were the smallest known particles, and they seemed to be elementary. But um, gradually, as more and more experiments were being done in the turn of the century and into the 1920s, we began to realise there were other phenomena occurring which you wouldn't have expected if the neutrons and the protons were the basic building blocks. Now in 1964, independently, two guys came up with the idea that the protons and the neutrons weren't elementary, they were made up of three other little particles whizzing around each other. These particles were called aces by George Zweig, but history has forgotten him, more or less. The other person, Murray Gell Mann, called them quarks. Apparently, it's to do, it came from, from the quark, came from the quack of a duck. Okay, so that's where he, he knew he wanted something like that. And originally he thought about the sound of a quacking duck and he wanted it to be called quark, quark, quark. Um, I know that the name, so the name quarks was, uh, uh, came from Murray Gell-Mann. I mean, he's a very special man, <laughs> Murray Gell-Mann, one of the brightest people I've ever come across and um, he, he invented the name. And he had read work by James Joyce, an Irishman, a poet, somebody who was a really wonderful writer and there was this quotation in his work, Finnegan's Wake, which is almost unreadable, three quarks for Mr. Mark. Three quarks for... Um, um, and he used this idea of quark as the basis of a very erudite particle. M muster mark, three quarks for muster mark. And I think it was simply that the three was there and the quarks were there and that sounded like quack. And he wanted the three because if you remember, he thought there was the up, the down and the strange and it all fitted beautifully. So you had these two different things and aces is much simpler, but quarks, well, that's what we've ended up with. Now, the trouble with this picture of quarks is that normally when you want to find out what something is made of, you build a bit of Lego and you want to find how it's done, you smash it to pieces and put it together again. Well, you try to do the same things with protons and neutrons to see if it's made of three particles, and they stick together with such strong forces that the more you pull them away, the more they want to stick together. So it seemed impossible to get any experimental evidence for the existence of these particles at all and they fell into disrepute. The third stage of the story is a, a famous scientist called Richard Feynman, a theoretician, goes and sees the people doing experiments in which electrons are bashing into protons. And he looks at the results and realises that he's got a way of thinking about it that will give evidence for the existence of these particles within the proton. And the way he imagines it involves relativity, which is a weird subject, but if you could imagine sitting on the electron and travelling at near the speed of light, any object you see, instead of being round, becomes squashed like a pancake. And as such, it becomes a two-dimensional object. And they call it pancakes. Inside this two-dimensional object, there are three little blobs that are visible to the electrons, and they smash into one blob, another blob, or another blob and you can analyse the results of the electron scattering and how it bashes into this and scatters off just by imagining there are three parts to this which will scatter. That was the smoking gun. With that, they had actually seen quarks, separate entities. But he didn't want to call it quark straight away because he was a bit more devilish than, than uh, most people. Highly intelligent, but, but he had a wicked sense of humour and didn't like to be bested. So he imagined there were three parts in this, and instead of calling them quarks, 
He called them partons and probably did that to wind his colleague Murray Gell-Mann up because they were polar opposites in character. Whereas Dick Feynman would wear shirt sleeves and dress like this, Murray Gell-Mann would wear tweed and uh, really be resplendent. Whereas Murray Gell-Mann would go to the faculty club and have nice lunches on perfect plates, he would go down to the Greasy Spoon and have a hamburger. They were complete opposite characters and didn't get along at all. And both are absolute geniuses. <laughs> and, um, they shared the same secretary. Uh, they lived, they had their two offices, and then in between them they had the secretary and both had a door into her office. And uh, people didn't know how to talk to, to these two guys in the same department because they were using different names and it might get confusing. But eventually, Murray Gell-Mann won out and everybody has called them quarks. The proton is made, it's not as simple as the original picture was because in the original picture, excuse me, I'm gonna take this bit of slice of apricot off and divide this up into three. So let's have three quarks. There's one bit of quark over there. Look how easy they are to separate in this model. And there's another one and there's a third. So in the original model put forward by Murray Gell-Mann, there were just these three which have different flavors. So this flavor, is just a word and this one is called up. The next one is called down and the next one is called strange because it was totally unexpected when it turned up. And originally, Gell-Mann thought there were just these three. Later on, people found that a, a more consistent picture would come if we divided these into two and imagine that there were six of them. So now we get to the stage where there are six quarks there's an up and a down, and this is called the first generation because they're the low energy ones. This is the second generation. They're higher energy and they took longer to appear. This is a strange and a charm quark. And then later on, there was a bottom and a top quark. And this was found in 1995, quite recently in, in my lifetime. It seems just the other day. And that is the current standing on the quarks, that there are these six quarks, they come in three families or generations. Uh, you have the up and the down form one. You have the charm and the um, uh, strange form the second one. And you have the top and the bottom form the third. And they have very similar properties, uh, except basically as you go from uh, right to left, from the up and then to the charm and then to the top, the masses of these particles increase and in fact, the top quark is something like, uh, let's see, it's 170, oh, what a stupid thing I'm about to try and do. Uh, the, the up quark is about 2 million electron volts, and the top quark is about 170 billion electron volts. So it's roughly 10 to the 5, 10, 100,000 times more massive than the up. So now we believe there are just these six quarks, but who knows if they go to higher energy, oh that tastes good, there could be others.